this is John Wesley Powell River History Museum's uh, kind of opening event for their waterways exhibition. They um, had story time this afternoon at the at the library, but this is the first opportunity to you know just kind of start the public programming piece of their wonderful project in force. So um, this is the over opening event for Waterways, uh, which is for those of you who may not know, is a traveling Smithsonian exhibition. And I'm Megan Van Frank, and I'm a pro program director at Utah Humanities um, and director of Think Water Utah, which is a large statewide conversation on the critical topic of water that we're presenting throughout the state with our partners like the John Wilson Powell Museum. As part of Think Water Utah, the Waterways exhibition is also part of Museum on Main Street, which is a community development collaboration between the Smithsonian Exhibition, Traveling Exhibition Service, and Utah Humanities. Museum on Main Street uh, brings together Smithsonian and individual state humanities councils and small museums all across the country um, in a joint effort to strengthen local cultural organizations and serve audiences, uh, raise topics, uh, build capacity, um, promote public history and good conversation. Uh, the Museum on Main Street partnership has been going since 1994 and Utah was one of the pilot states. So we've been doing this for 25 years and are still going strong. Uh, so we've toured Waterways exhibition to four communities this last year through Utah. Um, we were supposed to start in Green River actually last summer, but there's this funny thing called a pandemic, which kind of threw a, a wrench in the works and um, our opening was postponed and uh, we started at the Fremont Indian State Park instead and have since been down to the Kanab Museum and then up to the Swanner Preserve in Park City and are now coming back down to Green River and we're very happy to come for full circle because the John Wesley Powell Museum is one of my favorite museums in the state and um, in this gorgeous setting and this wonderful, wonderful subject area. And so we're just, it's, it's a perfect alignment. And so I'm very glad to have, have this exhibition there. Um, so in addition to coordinating the Utah Tour of Waterways, um, some of the things that you should just know that it's not just a traveling exhibition. We've been doing a lot of work with our local host museums. Um, providing them funding, um, putting on a public exhibition, you know, looks like it's just, yeah, just move it into the gallery and it's just beautiful there. And, and, and it is, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes um, and small museums in the state sometimes need help uh, learning some of the ins and outs of that and need some extra funding or some need some extra, you know, professional assistance. And so whatever any organization needs, and they get to determine that, um, my job is to try to help them with that. And so uh, it's a really wonderful uh, project and we're really happy to be doing it. I'd like to shout out um, to the Utah Museum of Fine Arts and to the Smithsonian Exhibition or Traveling Exhibition Service for helping me provide that kind of training to all of our local partners around the state. None of this would be possible without funding. And of course, as a you know, publicly funded uh, activity tonight, I have to acknowledge funders. So Museum on Main Street is supported by the United States Congress. Um, and the Utah Tour of Waterways has received funding from the state legislature, Utah Division of Arts and Museums, Division of State History, University of Utah's American West Center, the George S. and Dolores Story Eccles Foundation, who supports so many good things in the state, the Lawrence T. and Janet T. D. Foundation, Dominion Energy, Rocky Mountain Power, Union Pacific Foundation, KCBW Radio, Utah Public Radio, and of course, the National Endowment for the Humanities. And then of course, none of this would be possible in Green River without the fantastic staff at the John Wesley Powell River History Museum. Um, rocky year this last year with a lot, yeah, Roy, yeah. Um, Real rocky year with a, lots of staff turnover, but it's just been very smooth sailing since Candace has arrived. Um, thank you for that, Candace. We started this project way back in uh, 2019 with Kelsey Hart, who was the previous collections manager. She did a fantastic job um, on the companion exhibition that the museum has put together called uh, Our River is Our Community. And she had a wonderful view of what this exhibition could do for the museum. And Candace has picked that right up and has kept running with it. So thank you to Candace and to Jackie Nelson um, for your wonderful uh, work there at the museum. Um, and I guess the last thing I'd like to say is that if you are traveling around the state, we actually do have a second 
Smithsonian exhibition that we are touring as part of Think Water Utah. So in addition to Waterways, which is at the um, Green River Museum, we've got another exhibition called H2O Today, which is at the Cultural Celebration Center in West Valley uh, for another couple of weeks, and then it'll move out to Vernal, and then that uh, sometime in the summer will move up to the Bear River Heritage Area. So if you're out and about the state, um, or just paying attention to water programming generally, we've got a lot going on, and I invite you to visit um, our website at utahhumanities.org to find out more about that. Um, because apparently all of us love water and love rivers, and uh, there's a lot to be paying attention to. So with that huge introduction, I will pass it back to Candace to introduce Jim, uh, who's our speaker tonight. And I look forward to hearing what he has to say, because I love Deso and I'm excited to, to hear more about it. So thank you very much for uh, doing this, Candace. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, I, I'm Candace Cravens. I'm the executive director of the John Wesley Powell River History Museum here in Green River. And I, I joined the team back in October of 2020. So uh, still a bit of a newbie to the area, but really, really loving it here so far. And I have so enjoyed working on this waterways project with, with Megan. It's been a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I'm so glad you were all able to join us this evening. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Jim Ayton as our guest speaker for tonight. James M. Ayton is an award-winning author of seven books on the artists, rivers, and explorers of the Colorado Plateau. One of those books, The River Knows Everything, Desolation Canyon and the Green, is the subject of tonight's talk. From 1980 to 2020, Dr. Ayton was professor of English at the Southern Utah University. He is married to Fuse Glass artist Carrie Trenholm and is the father of Jennifer Perietti, a registered dietitian at Seattle Children's Hospital. She lives with her husband Ryan and two sons Jack and Rory in Seattle. Jim is also an avid boater who has run rivers all over the rest. <coughs> so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jim. Thank you so okay. much, Jim. Thanks, Candace. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, I always love anything to do with the John Wesley Powell River History Museum. And it's good to see some good friends out there, Roy and Matt and Mike and Amy and Loie and anyone else whose boxes I can't see. So thank you all. So um, first of all, uh, move forward here. I want to give a shout out to Dan Miller. Uh, Dan was uh, instrumental in getting me into this project. Uh, we worked on it for seven years and it was just a pleasure to work with Dan. Uh, Utah State University Press and John Alley were very supportive of this project uh, over the seven years that it took. Now, first thing, I know that there are actually two canyons, uh, Desolation Canyon and Gray Canyon, but following common usage, I will just refer to both canyons as Desolation, but I do know the difference. Uh, the canyon was named by John Wesley Powell in 1869 when he first went down the river, and it kind of helps to understand a little bit of Powell's mindset when he entered Desolation Canyon. They had just stopped above the canyon at Ure and had raided the garden of Pardon Dodds. Uh, they had had nothing for a month except for meat and biscuits, and they were hungry for some greens, and so they cut the potato tops off of uh, uh, some potatoes growing in Pardon Dodds garden. But what we know now is the potato tops contain a glycoalkaloid called solanine, which is a poison and hallucinogen. So when they entered Desolation Canyon, they were both hallucinating and they were sick and vomiting. The title of our book comes from a 1922 novel by Herman Hesse called Siddhartha. Uh, Hesse was a Nobel laureate, and it tells the story of Siddhartha, or the Buddha as we know him, who is seeking enlightenment and eventually ends up 
along a river where he meets a ferryman who tells him, it was the river that taught me how to listen. You too will learn how from the river. The river knows everything. One can learn everything from it. So consider this uh, a meditation on our relationship to the river in Desolation Canyon. Now, where is this river uh, that knows everything? Uh, the Green River cuts 120 mile swath through the middle of the Tavaputs Plateau where it uh, exits a canyon just north of Green River, Utah. And I got to know the river the same way that, that most people do, and that's running the river. Hey, Jim, uh, sorry. Yes. You're not sharing your screen. Oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, OK, let me go. Uh, I don't know what happened here. That's OK. There we go. Perfect. Now we can see your wonderful um, illustrations and photos. OK. Have, did you hear my voice? We did, yes. We hear your voice. Oh, OK. Just didn't see your pictures. <laughs> OK. Um, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do you want me to run back the pictures? Or no? Um, Should I go back? I pictures? think we can just. I think we could just move forward. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. All right. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so, um, Green River uh, cuts through uh, Desolation Canyon, and it's uh, it's actually uh, there are two rivers that come in. Uh, and that is the Green River and the Yampa River. And the Yampa River is a wild river. So when the river uh, floods every year, uh, we get a, a, a diverse array of, of, of riparian resources along the river, cottonwoods and uh, box elders and willows all along the river. And so uh, desolation is the most, the healthiest and the wildest river in the Colorado system. Uh, it boasts uh, great wildlife, uh, bighorn sheep, deer, mule deer, uh, elk, moose. It also boasts a wild array of of cultural resources from Fremont granaries to pictographs to uh, Ute petroglyphs and historic ranches and, uh, and ferry operations. But all is not well in Desolation Canyon because since 1964, Flaming Gorge Dam has plugged the Green River, uh, limiting floods and floods are crucial to uh, the health of a river. Uh, fortunately, the Yampa River is still a free-flowing river, the last free-flowing river in the Colorado system, but uh, the city of Denver is making noises about uh, possibly damming the river. There are also more and more oil and gas wells in the upper reaches of the, of the canyon along uh, those areas. Uh, they proliferate every year and those, uh, those oil wells bring in more roads and uh, bring in uh, pot hunters and uh, people doing damage to the rock art uh, and the cultural resources along the river. Uh, they seem to increase exponentially every year. So uh, what to do about this river? Um, how do, we, how do we deal with these threats? Well, it helps, of course, to know uh, the river's past and the canyon's past. Uh, up until around 1950, uh, for 13,000 years, people have lived in this canyon. Uh, now, it's the geology is what really brings people to this canyon. And there are basically three geologic periods that appear along the river's edge. And it's relatively simple geology, and it's what brings river runners and uh, oil drillers into the canyon. 
the first period is a 40 million period between 90 and 50 million years ago when sediments drained out of highlands into ancient Lake Uinta and they were very high in organic material. And of course that led, leads to hydrocarbons, which is what oil drillers are interested in. That, that gives us oil and gas and gilsonite and, and shale and tar sands uh, and coal. Uh, the second period is the last two million years since uh, the Ice Age when we've had massive flows through the canyon, really carving the canyons. And so Desolation Canyon as a canyon is relatively recent, geologically speaking, about uh, two million years old. And then the last period is the, the recent period of debris flows coming into the canyon, uh, throwing rocks into the river and creating rapids like we saw 12 years ago when Joe Hutch Canyon flashed and it created uh, a much larger rapid, a cow swim rapid. It went from being a fairly fun rapid into somewhat dangerous rapid now. Uh, Desolation has the largest debris flows in the Colorado system. Uh, it has amazing flora of, of all kinds, way too many to mention here. Uh, its river bottoms are in pretty good shape in terms of native grasses we see here uh, needle and thread uh, near a fretwater canyon. Box elders line the upper reaches of the canyon. And cottonwoods invite river runners to camp under their shade. Although the cottonwoods are not in particularly good shape because cottonwoods, is the writer Ellen Malloy says, run their sex lives on floods. And because of the dam and climate change, uh, those floods have become less and less. So uh, cottonwoods may not be able to reproduce much in the future. All kinds of wildlife in, in life. As I said, antelope, bighorn sheep, moose, elk, deer. Uh, Desolation has the healthiest black bear population in the state. But it's not just the, the natural resources that, that are what are so attractive. As I said, people have lived in Desolation Canyon for 13,000 years. The first people in the canyon were the Clovis hunters around 11,000 BC. And their points have been found uh, east and west in the upper reaches of the canyon. Archaic hunter, hunters came in for thousands of years, uh, hunting wild game and gathering wild plants. And they left their rock guard at places like uh, this in Range Creek overlooking the canyon. The most populous group of people to have lived in the canyon are the Tabaputs Fremont, uh, who frequented the canyon between uh, AD 600 and 1300. The Fremont were part-time farmers, part-time hunter-gatherers, and they farmed down in the canyon, although they seem to have lived up in the, in the side canyons. Uh, and they stored their food in extremely difficult to, um, to access places uh, in these granaries up on in amazing, uh, amazingly difficult to get to places. They were clearly afraid of someone or something getting to their food. Um, around 1300, they disappear from the archaeological record. And so where did they go? Well, there's a lot of debate about this. Uh, they may have just left the area. They may have joined with the Utes who came in. Uh, the Utes may have killed them off. Uh, the Utes may be the Fremont. Uh, there's a lot of debate about this and no clear evidence to answer that question. What we do know is that by AD 1300, the Utes appear in the archaeological record and there were a number of, of bands who interacted with Desolation Canyon. There were the Yampatika or the White River Utes. Uh, there were the Uinta Utes from the Uinta Basin. There were the Tavawich or the Yunkapagre Utes of Western Colorado, the Sheberich Utes from down around Green River and possibly even the Timpanogich Utes. Uh, 
the Utes, uh, like the archaic hunters, came down to the river to gather wild plants and hunt game. And they called the Green River Pianu Kuit, which means bigger river. That is bigger than the White and the, and the Duchesne rivers uh, that are pictured here. The Uinta Utes uh, acquired the horse in by 1820. And uh, when fur trappers appeared five years later, uh, they commented, William Ashley commented how cosmopolitan the Utes were. And the Utes were able to successfully interact with the fur trappers until the mid 1840s, uh, trading access to beaver, which the fur trappers were interested in, for horses. And they became extremely wealthy, extremely powerful. Uh, and so, um, in between times, in between the Utes and then later the Mormons, there was a small herd of buffalo that was extirpated between Ute hunters and, and, uh, and fur trappers and, and later Mormons coming in. But that uh, buffalo herd was reestablished in the 1870s by the Ute tribe. When the Mormons showed up, though, in 1847, at first the Utes welcomed them because they felt based on their experience with the fur trappers that they could deal with Anglos. They were deadly wrong. Uh, the fur trappers wanted one animal. The Mormons wanted their land uh, and hence their way of life. And so there was a lot of conflict between uh, the Utes and the Mormons over time. And by 1860, after the Walker War, there was a, a reservation established in the Uinta Basin and the Utes were moved to that, to that reservation. Uh, later, after the, the Black Hawk War and the so-called Meeker Massacre, there were a number of uh, Ute tribes from Western Colorado, uh, the Uncompagres and the White River or Yampatika Utes, who were moved to uh, east of Desolation Canyon where the Uncompagre Reservation was established. But then between the Dawes Act of 1887 and the discovery of Gilsonite, uh, those reservations were, were uh, gradually reduced. Um, the Utes got some of that reservation back on the Hill Creek extension in the 1930s. The first Anglos into desolation were the fur trappers. Uh, and they were looking for beaver because that was the, um, Beaver was what men's hats, uh, was the fashionable material for men's hats. Uh, and so uh, following uh, William Ashley, there were a number of trappers, Denise June, the Green River in, in Chandler Canyon and elsewhere along the Green and Colorado Rivers, and Anton Robidoux, who came out of uh, Santa Fe, and he had a fur trading post up in the Uinta Basin at White Rocks, and also one uh, at Ure, uh, near the confluence of the Green and the, the White River. Uh, Robidoux would take his pelts up Hill Creek, uh, east of Desolation Canyon, down Westwater Creek, and in 1837, he left his inscription along the river, or along Westwater Creek, and it says in French, Anton Robidoux passed here on November 13th, 1837, he established a trading post at the confluence of the Green and Uinta Rivers. By 1844, the Utes had burned two of Robidoux's three trading posts, uh, alcohol, uh, slave trading, uh, and the fur trapping may have, have uh, hastened these, these uh, these actions by the Utes. But by that time, the, bird, the beaver were just about trapped out. Fortunately for the beaver, the men's fashions uh, in hats changed uh, and the beaver have recovered somewhat in the canyon. Uh, the most famous Anglo explorer to come into the canyon was John Wesley Powell, who we mentioned previously. Powell came down first in 1869 and he was also the first Anglo to really study the native culture, uh, the Utes and the Paiutes to collect their language and their, 
material culture and to study their 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 stories. Um, his second trip in 1871 gave us the first photographic images of Desolation Canyon and also gave us the first maps. Uh, he was followed by numerous explorers, one of whom was James Birch in 1906. Birch was looking for a way to transport Gilsonite down the river uh, to a railhead not too far from Green River, Utah. And he determined in his report, uh, rather ridiculously, that uh, Gilsonite ore could be transported down the river if just a few of the rapids were dynamited. Well, he would have had to dynamite scores of rapids. And as any river runner knows, most of the year, the river is so low, you could never transport Gilsonite ore down the river. Another expedition that came down in 1922, a joint effort by Utah Power and Light and the US Geological Survey, and they were looking for potential dam sites. And they identified two of them in desolation, one just above Rock Creek and one at Rattlesnake Canyon. For a variety of reasons, those dams obviously never got built. And we could talk about that afterwards in the question and answer period if anyone's interested. Uh, for Pleasure was George Flavel in 1896, but river running for pleasure really sort of picked up in the late 1930s with people like Buzz Holmstrom, who was a hero to many river runners, and then uh, commercial river running with Norman Nevels in 1940, who pioneered commercial river running on the green and Colorado rivers and San Juan rivers. But in between Ashley in 1825 and um, uh, river running in, in 1940, uh, there were a number of Anglos who came into the canyon looking for the last place to settle. And Desolation Canyon became the place of last resort. The first Anglos to come into the canyon were actually outlaws like Butch Cassidy and Flatnose Curry, because it turns out desolation was a good place to hide stolen livestock. The first ranch in the canyon was in 1887 uh, at Florence Creek. Jim McPherson, who was 15 years old, came with his two uncles in uh, 1887, and they took over Florence Creek from Trapper Jack. Uh, a couple years later, McPherson's uncles drowned in the river, and the teenager took over the ranching operation by himself. Um, he eventually married Taurus McPherson of Provo in uh, 1898, and actually, when he was heading out to get married uh, in Provo, uh, he was stopped by a, a, a sheriff's posse looking for outlaw Joe Walker, and he was just sure that uh, Jim McPherson knew where Joe Walker was. Well, they made McPherson go back to the ranch, even though he said, hey, I'm going out to get married. They said, no, you're going back with this to the ranch, and you're going to tell us where Joe Walker is. Well, Jim McPherson didn't give up uh, Walker's whereabouts, but a ranch hand did, and so the posse eventually ambushed Joe Walker and killed him. McPherson was 11 days late for his wedding. Um, and his wife, Tora, later said she just figured he had changed his mind. But by all accounts, they had a long and happy marriage. McPherson built a beautiful rock house and had uh, fruit trees and just ran a first rate cattle operation uh, there along the river. And people often commented upon what a modern house he had and, you know, the, the verdant uh, trees and, and the hospitality of the McPhersons. Uh, Jim McPherson was known for his Hereford Bulls, and, and he took all of his savings one year and went back to Kansas City and bought his first bull, who he called Ironsides. They brought the bull down to the ranch and the idea was to take it across the river and go up on the West Plateau in the summer where it could breed with the cows. So they didn't think that they could swim the bull across the river. So they put it on this 
ferry and took it across the river. And as soon as Ironsides got across the river, uh, it jumped in the river and swam back to the east side. And Jim McPherson was so angry, he took a pitchfork to the bull and prodded it back across the river. Well, they eventually got the bull up to the plateau, the West Tava Blitz Plateau, to breed with his cows. And within a few days, a grizzly bear swatted it and killed it. And there went all his savings. Uh, but he persisted in the bull business and eventually uh, started again and was able to uh, sell his Hereford bulls all over uh, Western Colorado and Eastern Utah. Uh, one of Jim's daughters, uh, he had four daughters, by the way, and one son. One of his daughters, Pearl, married uh, a local guy, a local rancher named Budge Wilcox. And in 1930, uh, Jim sold the ranch to Budge, and he ran it for 10 years, and then he sold out to the Ute tribe. It was reestablishing uh, the Hill Creek operation. Uh, from, 18, from 1940 to 1946, uh, Uncompagre Ute named Ure McCook ran the ranch, and but in 1946, uh, he came in one year and the ranch was on fire. Someone had burned the ranch down and that stopped um, the ranch. But in the 1960s, the Ute tribe built a, a lodge there next to the old uh, ranch house and they ran a hunting operation. It was kind of an on and off operation from 1970 to 1990s uh, run by uh, you river guide, uh, his Rick Chapoose and his, his parents ran the operation. Uh, after 1990s, it, the, the, the lodge fell apart. Uh, and about 10 years ago, uh, Roland McCook Jr. tried to uh, rehabilitate the lodge, but the, that operation failed. When Jim McPherson had his Cradle Lamb Ranch, uh, he hired his uh, brothers-in-law, the Seamounts, to work at his ranch. And then in 1905, uh, the Seamount brothers uh, bought out the Rock Creek operation from Shed Lunt, and they ran that ranch from 1905 to 1925. There were four brothers involved in it, uh, Ed, Alf, Dan, and Bill. Uh, Bill uh, pictured here, or Dan pictured here on the left, and Bill in the white shirt on the right were the main two brothers involved in the Rock Creek operation. They also built a beautiful stone house with the help of Jim McPherson's uh, stonemason out of Provo, a guy named Frenchie, who's not to be confused with another Frenchie named Eugene Irod, who worked in the area. Uh, they also had a first class um, Hereford Bull operation, had beautiful uh, fruit orchard and um, ran a really good operation until 1925. They took their herd up onto the West Tava Puts in March. It was a little bit too early and a blizzard killed off their herd. So they were forced to sell out. They were deeply in debt and they sold out to the Downard brothers, John and Ernest Downard. The Downard brothers had it from 1925 to 1946 when they sold out to Irvin Gerber. Gerber had it for a few years and then he sold out to T.N. Jensen. And the Jensen family has owned it since around 1948. It's now owned by T.N.'s son, uh, Butch Jensen and his daughter, Jeannie Wilcox Jensen, uh, as well as, as Hunt Oil. Uh, the ranch burned in 1966, um, and so it's been pretty much abandoned since then. But there were, weren't just Utes, or there weren't just Anglos in the canyon during these years. There were still some Ungapagra Utes, one of whom was Red Moon. Red Moon was an Ungapagra Ute who ran horses between what they what's called Moon Bottom uh, in Upper Desolation. And East have a put split. Red Moon distrusted whites, and it's hard to blame him. Uh, and he had a very uneasy relationship with 
um, with the Anglos in the canyon. Uh, he uh, ran his horses between the 1880s and 1929 when he died. Uh, one of uh, Red Moon's in Canyon was, was ferryman uh, Hank Stewart. Hank uh, had, a, had a ferry uh, and crossed sheep between the east and west sides. In his best year, he, he, he crossed 50,000 sheep at Sand Wash, where, uh, where River Runners put in today. He actually had originally had his ferry up at Tijuana Bottom about 25 miles up river. And in the winter of 1919, 1920, he and his wife, Elsie, who's pictured here with their son, Arden, took apart their cabin, numbered every log and slid them down on the ice on a bobsled and reconstructed the cabin at Sand Wash. And you can still see that cabin today, along with a couple of other uh, cabins there that were constructed later. Uh, their son Arden just died a few years ago and had been the sheriff uh, of uh, Uinta County. In 1930, Hank sold the uh, ferry operation to Chuck Sands and he moved up river to Willow Creek where he had a ranching operation. One May in 1937, he and a ranch hand named Thomas McKenna were crossing a corn planter in, uh, in a spring flood and they flipped um, their boat and they both drowned as their wives watched helplessly. Uh, just a tragic situation. Uh, meanwhile, the, the uh, ferry down at Sand Wash passed through a number of hands and ended up with a guy named Ray Thompson who kept it until the 1950s when it uh, basically had, had the traffic had, had tripped uh, result in just a trickle for a variety of reasons. Um, there was no longer a need for a ferry down in the canyon. Uh, one of Hank Stewart's friend was a moonshiner named Ben Morris. Uh, during prohibition, Ben Morris and a couple of other moonshiners uh, were able to make use the, the, uh, uh, the remoteness of Desolation Canyon to uh, make moonshine to sell to ranches and in the Uinta Basin. Uh, ben Morris was always in trouble with the law, uh, but people really liked him a lot and they liked what he did. And he, he had a still up at Firewater Canyon. Uh, he was, he and John Dowling uh, and Frank Hyde were, were moonshiners who operated in the canyon in the, in the, during Prohibition. The last Anglo that I want to talk about is a ranch hand by the name of Lou Ackland. Ackland squatted down at Chandler Creek and lived in this cabin, and he worked at some of the ranches there, and he used the remoteness of Desolation Canyon to dodge the draft in World War II, and he was successful for a while until someone ratted him out, and so they, they conscripted him into the army and they sent him overseas and he survived the war, but after the war he did not return to Desolation Canyon because for a variety of reasons the ranching and, and uh, ferry business uh, had basically ceased to exist. And so for the first time in 13,000 years, Desolation Canyon became truly desolate. Since 1950, Basically, Desolation Canyon has been managed by a number of government agencies. First, the Uinta Ure Ute Indian Tribe, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, the Bureau of Reclamation, the U.S. Forest Service, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, uh, and the Utah Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining. Uh, the Utah, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation has had to manage Flaming Gorge Dam because of the Endangered Species Act uh, to try to preserve the native fish. And they've had to operate the dam and try to uh, mimic historic flows by uh, releasing flows out of the river in the spring uh, to try to manage the river uh, 
to preserve the native fish. And it's, it's really uh, a big question as to whether they'll be able to preserve the native fish. Because besides the dam, uh, there are non-native fish competing and also pollutants in the river. The main uh, federal agency uh, managing the river, of course, is the Bureau of Land Management. Duty is to manage the 6,000 river runners who come down the river every year uh, and uh, make sure and so forth. Uh, they also try to keep native, uh, uh, non-native trees out, uh, such as Russian olives. And they monitor cultural resources and since 2006 have been uh, supporting uh, uh, in-depth survey of cultural resources, historic and prehistoric, uh, conducted by the Colorado Plateau Archaeological Alliance, seen working here. There have been some feral cattle down in the canyon, and in 1990, uh, the Bureau of Land Management uh, killed some feral cattle who may or may not have belonged to a local rancher. Uh, the rancher said he would uh, remove the cattle. They didn't. The BLM came down, shot the cattle, and it uh, became kind of a national controversy for a short period of time. And that brings us pretty much up to the present. And so one could ask, uh, what about the canyon's future? Well, the legendary uh, Yankees manager, Casey Stengel, is reported to have said, never make predictions, especially about the future. So I will follow Casey Stengel's advice. I won't predict what the future is going to be in Desolation Canyon. But we can ask, what should the future of Desolation Canyon be? As responsible citizens in a democracy, we can determine within nature's limits what the future of Desolation Canyon should be. Should it be a canyon lined with oil and gas wells, as some would say we need for America's energy future? Or should we, Desolation Canyon remain a wild and desolate place, as, as Major Powell said. Well, um, if you have an opinion about that, I would urge you to make your views known. I would urge you to uh, write your local public land managers, uh, write your local politicians or politicians in Washington, D.C., the Uinta Ure tribe, uh, the Secretary of the Interior, uh, Deborah Holland, uh, write your local newspapers, post things on social media, let your views be known as to what you think Desolation, Canyon, Desolation Canyon's future should be. That's all I have to say. I thank you and I would be happy to entertain questions. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Jim. That was great. Um, we do have a couple questions that already came through on the chat. I'll kind of go in the order that they were uh, posted. Um, so if anybody has any more questions, you still have time to go ahead and put them in the chat box for me. Um, Roy has a question. He wants to know, did the Mormons explore Desolation Canyon or the surrounding area? Um, not that I know of. Do you know, Roy? No, other than uh, other than cowboys um, who may have been Mormons. No, I don't know of any Mormons who explored the area, but I could be wrong. He also wants to know about the dam site at Coal Creek. Oh, yes. Um, this was actually not a USGS. This was a private venture. <coughs> And um, it was begun in the early uh, 20th century. And the idea was to, to dam uh, right uh, by Cold Creek Rapid. And it was, a, it, they began to hand dig uh, the dugways. Uh, and uh, the idea was to uh, channel water all the way down to Green River for farms. And it was, it was really a, a far-fetched idea. 
and it was called the Buell Dam because one of the developers was a guy named Buell. And uh, it was kind of an on again, off again operation in the, in the early 19th century. I think by about 1913, it was just kaput. Uh, but you can see there's a cabin there now and uh, where the, where the, a couple of cabins where the uh, crew lived and worked. And you can see the, the keyhole, uh, the keyways that they were digging by hand. And it never got very far. There's a lot more about it in the book, of course. Great, thanks. So Mike asks, are there reaches of a canyon that were never grazed due to inaccessibility and can serve as relic slash reference areas? Uh, not that I know of. Um, as far as I know, every area was grazed, but um, you know, the river bottoms are in, in DC. Uh, cattle have been out of there for a good 30, 40 years for the most part. And the river bottoms are in, in decent shape. All right, thanks. Um, another, there's a comment from Roy. Uh, Jim should mention the names of Jim McPherson's daughters. Very charming names. Uh, I'm not sure I can remember them all. I don't have my book here, Roy. Um, they were sure. named, I can't remember. If, if Roy knows, if, uh, if, Roy, if Roy knows, he can yeah. he can throw them in the chat for us. He, he put a couple of other good resources in there for us to, to read. All right, cool. I'm gonna scroll down here a little bit. Um, another question for Mike. What is known about pre-settlement beaver populations in Desolation and how do current numbers compare? Um, that's a great question and I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, presumably there were a, a whole lot of beaver because there's not, there's not that many anymore. Uh, but I don't know that, I don't think anyone's done any kind of study on that that I know of. That's a great question. And Amy asks, what would be your best case ideal scenario for the future of the area? Um, great question, Amy. Um, first of all, that the Yampa River is never dammed. That would be, that would be ideal because uh, the Yampa contributes half the flow of the river, which makes desolation the closest thing to what John Wesley Powell saw in 1869. Uh, I would prefer not to have any more oil drilling in and around the canyon uh, and, and any, any other roads. Uh, Desolation really only has one road into the canyon and that comes in on the Ute side uh, down Chandler. So I would, I would ideally uh, leave it be a, a roadless area. And then in my pipe dream of pipe dreams, uh, uh, Flaming Gorge Dam would be deconstructed and taken apart and the river would, would, would be a free flowing river again. That would be a good start. And kind of building off of that, I'm gonna to touch on Megan's question before I jump back to Mike's. Um, who do we write to in order to express concerns about damming the Yampa? Um, from what I've read, it's the city of Denver who's who's talking about doing that. And there's there's also some private entrepreneur, and I can't remember his name, but it's it's the city of Denver. And, and Roy may have more up-to-date information on this than I do. I haven't heard anything in a couple of years, but I don't know. All right, let's see here. I'm gonna scroll back up to Mike's here. Um, is there any evidence or anecdotes of indigenous peoples traveling down the river? Uh, no, um, no evidence of prehistoric people uh, using boats and um, no evidence of the Utes uh, constructing boats. 
that I know of. I think they probably just waited till the river went down and swam or walked across if they had to get across. And I believe I just uh, unmuted Roy if he had anything he wanted to chime in with. <laughs> <laughs> As our other, the river historian of the group here. <laughs> river, Roy, can you answer any of my questions, any of your <laughs> questions? Um, I was thinking of, uh, well, I, I saw Loie already answered the one about um, Jim's daughters, which I just thought were such charming names. Uh, Zelfa and Fern and Pearl and Ioni. <laughs> Those are, and I yeah. jumped up to try to find my copy of the book, but I think I moved it down to Moab. Um, let's see. The, and the other thing I was gonna say is the Buell Dam that you mentioned, there was a big irrigation boom and bust in the early 20th century. And, you know, people sold land is going to be available for, um, you're, you're going to get rich buying this land and then irrigating it. And it was a, just a lot of it was just a big scam. And it's really well described by Wallace Stegner in his uh, Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Angle of Repose. Yeah. So, Great book. Yes. What was it? The desert, uh, the, the desert. Desert Land, Land Act. Act. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Desert Land Act. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, another was that uh, there's a uh, um, KUED, which is the University of Utah's PBS station, did a documentary on the green called Green River Divided Waters. And um, yeah. we all did a river trip on that. To Then they did a lot of filming. And Jim was on that. I was on it. Dennis Willis was on it and it was a it was a lot of fun project and it's a good documentary it was done in 1999 yeah. you can find it on the uh, KWD website yeah Nancy Green directed that it, she yes. did a great job yeah she really did don't let me talk too much here as you know I can do um, <laughs> finally the other one I think I had was Ben Morris wasn't he one of Josie Bassett's husbands he was he was Josie's fifth as they say <laughs> Um, yeah. 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 They had a one day. Um, they had a big fight, and and she kicked him out, and uh, uh, he was just kind of a slob, I guess, in the way he ate. And um, but they remained friends somehow, and um, even when he got put in jail, she was helping him out. He got put in jail for uh, shooting a sheep herder. He hated sheep, and. Uh, he was a cattleman and um, he, he shot a guy, didn't kill him. Let's see if I had any other. Josie Bassett, by the way, uh, her fourth husband died in mysterious circumstances in a hotel in Linwood, Colorado. And there was a headline about that. Um, fourth husband of Josie Bassett dies in hotel and mysterious circumstances. Another story I heard about her husband's was that one of them built built kind of a round cabin and somebody said, well, why did you do that? And he said, so that when Josie gets after me, she can't corner me before I can get out the door. <laughs> yeah. And you can still see her cabin in Dinosaur National Monument um, uh, past the quarry on the quarry side. The Josie's cabin is a mm -hmm. really charming place. Wonderful place. All right. Well, thank, thanks, Roy. Um, does anybody else have any other questions they'd like to throw in the chat before we kind of wrap things up? Great questions so far, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, so before we all kind of scatter, I'm gonna drop a link in the chat box, um, a couple of links actually. One is a link to a uh, brief survey. We would love for you to fill out for us just to let us know how we're doing with programming for waterways. It's really short, only a couple of um, tick box type questions. Um, we'd love to hear from you if you just follow that link in the chat box. And I'd also like to invite you all to some of our other upcoming events that we have. And I'm gonna throw a link, another link in the chat box with a link to our website um, that has information on all of our upcoming events 
to go along with waterways. We have a couple of, couple of uh, uh, Zoom lectures coming up. So those of you who near and far can join in a couple different great talks. We've got Greg Smoke um, coming in and also uh, Roy, Roy Webb's gonna be another one of our guest uh, presenters and a couple of other fun events if you happen to be in the area. We've got a couple of in-person things planned. So uh, I'd love to see some of your faces again, um, some of your names again and some of our upcoming events. And Megan, did you have anything else you wanted to uh, chat about? Thank you. This is really your program, Candace, and you and Jim. But um, I've just put a couple of links in there, uh, the chat. So um, Candace mentioned that Greg Smoke, who is an historian, environmental historian um, uh, at the University of Utah, heads up the American West Center there. He is the scholar uh, that we um, engage to help us think uh, our whole statewide team think about uh, and learn about the complexities of the real complexities of water in the state. And so he wrote this beautiful essay, um, which I just always happen to have handy, <laughs> but there's a PDF of it and I've just thrown the link in the chat. And the second thing was, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on around the state. Uh, lots of public programming, lots of Zoom programming. So even if you're sitting, you know, all the way down in St. George, you can just tune in. <coughs> Uh, to Green River or Cedar City or like wherever. Um, and that's, I guess, one of the bright sides of, of our new normal. But anyway, the, there's a lot going on around the state and the website that I just dropped in there um, has a virtual calendar there um, specifically to the what I lovingly call the water circus. And uh, you can see what's going on uh, statewide. Thanks, Candace and Jim, this was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. So um, if no one else has any questions, I haven't seen any more pop in the chat box. I'm just kind of reading through them. Thank you all so much. Um, thanks so much for joining me this evening. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and stop the recording here. Um, have a wonderful evening and I hope to see you at a future event. Thank you guys Yay. so much. Mm -hmm. Good night. Thank you.